we're here to talk to you about designing empathy into open hardware projects and explain something of the need for that and where we kind of took our research. So we are working on a project that's part of the Creative Exchange, and the Creative Exchange brings together companies, academics, and makers in the UK, and it's sponsored by the research councils. Um, so on our project, we're kind of, the Numbers That Matter was a collaborative project that sought to embed the values of open um, from community right through to manufacture. And we brought together the academics, as I said, and of our academics, we had quite a kind of eclectic mix. So we had Chris Boyko, who is a planner, who did the kind of public labs, living labs side of things, and Mel Woods, who's a design academic based in Dundee. And then we also had companies. So we had Huayung, who's got a background starting a community workshop in Manchester, and a career as a private detective. And also Dave Mee, who's a creative technologist. Um, and then there's myself, Hannah, and Marley, and we're PhD researchers, and we kind of, our PhD is formed by doing these live projects with the maker community. So, it sounds all lovely. It's a collaboration. It's open. What's not to love? So, why does that matter? And like everyone else in this room, we get open. We believe in open. We will happily sign manifestos and put up well-designed banners to proclaim our love of open and how we really believe in the documentation and the open access and the shared values and the sharing the source and the community. And we kind of genuinely believe that we want to be part of this revolution and this production as opposed to being part of the kind of last century's way of producing and way of doing commerce. Um, but we also think there's a genuine urgency with this. So like Jesse Vincent said on Twitter a few days ago, if you thought the dot-com boom was bad, then just wait until the data silos with your data in all go pop in a few years. And then with this kind of urgency, there's also this kind of huge responsibility. And that an open community for a few just creates another elite. And that just creates another class system and another divide. And we need to really be conscious of who that we is that we're designing for. And then very aware of the demographics and our limitations as a demographic that is predominantly male and pale. <laughs> that we want to kind of do eyes wide open, open. Not catchy, not going to catch on as a phrase. But that kind of very aware of our implicit values and very aware of our positioning in society and within communities. So within that, we were kind of... We've got this huge standpoint and huge privilege of being very aware of data, being very aware of open hardware, and aware of our networks having an aptitude that isn't necessarily shared by a broader community. So we wanted to work with the broader communities about awareness of data in everyday life. And we were working with kind of deprived communities in East Manchester, in the UK. And we didn't want to go in there as these kind of data and open hardware evangelists and just sell them this kind of the good news of open hardware. <laughs> we wanted to go in there and kind of talk to people and say, what data matters to you? And bring this kind of concept of data back down to a kind of understandable, mediatable, usable level. Right, so um, we looked at kind of three things that we wanted to focus on with the people in, in daily lives. And, and data is such an abstract thing. Um, and it's really big. So how do you make it meaningful to you? And I think um, from some of the talks in the morning, there was this common theme of like being human-centric or thinking about connecting to people and hardware or something physical, something tangible is a really great way to do that. So we wanted to focus on data that was open as opposed to other types of, of data and wearables that could look outward so it's more um, sociable or you're more aware of your environment and less of the quantified self type of wearables that tracks how many steps you've been taking or what your stool sample looks like. Um, and also the aspect of well-being because that will kind of raise awareness of where you live and you'll take more interest in it. So we want to see how data can affect 
your neighborhood, or if, if knowing something about something that's going on in your neighborhood will affect you and your health and your well-being and all the other good stuff. So um, when we, we looked at people in East Manchester, especially people who are disconnected from a lot of the um, conversation and debate around open hardware, open source, data, uh, because they wouldn't have had an awareness of it enough to impact on what kind of number or data that would matter to them. So we looked at, um, oh, sorry, you go ahead. So that was the problem. How do, we, how do we find the people Yeah. who are using data, who are, who are, not, who are being affected but didn't know how to engage with data? Yeah, absolutely. So that kind of problem in summary is obviously the kind of the tech scene we can very, very well design for ourselves, but ourselves is not necessarily representative. So we needed to kind of learn how to design with empathy. And then we kind of didn't want to go in there with this naive optimism that technology would save us and would be relevant to half of these communities. And then also that when research happens with these communities, um, it's market driven and it comes at it from the standpoint and the biases and the benefit of the companies producing products. It doesn't come at it from the community point of view. So the approach was to focus on the humans and we thought there might be certain types of people who would have hidden knowledge of how well a community was doing. So these are the gate, kind of gatekeepers to the wealth, uh, the health of a neighborhood. And we thought they would be taxi drivers, um, hair beauty salons or barber shops, and a neighborhood watch. So we found these people and um, tried to find out what was important to them. But we ran into a lot of problems, uh, mostly that they don't trust you because <laughs> you're not from the hood. Uh, and they had a... Um, uh, they kind of belittled their contribution to something like this, to kind of an academic research, or, or even the idea that we really want to know what they were talking about was something they couldn't understand either. So as far as our methodology with this, we obviously didn't want to... We realized quite fast that there wasn't like a hairdresser's convention where we could handily go in and run a focus group and maybe do some funky co-design stuff. That wasn't going to happen in this community. So our methodology was we did ethnographic rich research in the field with a kind of topic guided interview. But to do this with hairdressers, obviously you, the simplest thing is you go book an appointment. So we're there, kind of your scalp massage, and interviewing them about their experience, about their communities, about what matters to them in their neighborhoods. And then from that, we typed up, we analyzed, and we extrapolated. And then we used the kind of extrapolated data, which is quite rich, obviously, and very human data. It's not the kind of big, scary data. Um, to inform both personas and storyboards, which we fed into a toolkit so that we can kind of inform our methodology going forward. And also to um, find data that was relevant from open data sources, which we then kind of fed into our hackathon. Now, of course, with a hackathon, usually caffeine-fueled, not really big emphasis on well-being in hackathons. So we had to kind of quite carefully design the hackathon and make sure we had nice food, make sure that we kind of sent people home to bed, <laughs> things like that, which was quite an interesting dynamic to kind of manage. And then both from the experience with the hackathon and from the kind of experience in the field and then all of the mistakes we made trying to talk to communities and trying to kind of really work alongside and train ourselves to be empathetic and not be kind of academically judgmental and kind of think, oh, I know what a hairdresser thinks. Um, we kind of have put this together in some simple tools, including some we'd like to show you tomorrow, ideally, like activity books. And that's kind of, we want to kind of remove us from the process, quite frankly, <laughs> because it shouldn't be us as uh, academics and makers and similar going into these communities to kind of go save them from their technology issues. Um, we should be kind of equipping people on the ground to go and think these things through and kind of sharing our knowledge and sharing our processes and our ways of working so that they can kind of apply that, adapt that and change that in their own communities. Um, so some of the outcomes from this project um, have been that uh, community is an organic process. You, don't, you can't just snap one up. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, 
technology is not always going to save us. Uh, sometimes you don't need a tech solution. You don't need, not everything needs an app for it. And um, designing for empathy, especially if you're working with communities. Um, we found, we tried to mitigate some of the issues of a hackathon by have, running a series of lightning talks with the experts from the community, from the health industry as well, to uh, kind of help the people who are hacking to come up with projects and made sure that it was a field trial award for the winning hack instead of a cash prize, which kind of incentivized people to think about the sustainability of their hack beyond the two days of pizza-fueled intensity. Um, I just want to tell you about three of the projects that have gone on after, beyond the weekend. One of them is uh, Super Forager, which is um, a, a little thing on your belt that will rumble if you're near something that you can eat in, in the wild. Uh, there's Happy Hands, that's wearables um, with gloves, heated gloves, and, and Path Patterns, which uses um, a totally un you utilized uh, demographic grannies and their trolleys to see where um, they go in the neighborhood and what pavements they avoid and, and why they might do that. So that's kind of an aggregate data pool for, for shopping grannies. And mums with trolleys. As oh, well. and mums and, and strollers. Also wheels in a neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Anything with wheels. And so obviously the challenge is going from this kind of little research project to going and to kind of try and comment on what's best practice and share that with other people so they can make use of it and to kind of go beyond that into the point where we can have some replicable design patterns. And of course the problem is that in technology our systems, our ways of working, our approaches and our biases are quite embedded. And in the early stages as we are with the open hardware movement, if we can start to embed in new practices, new processes, and new approaches that take on board the experiences and realities of everyday communities, as well as our own kind of pet projects, I think that that's the point where we'll realize and be empathetic with the numbers that matter to those communities. And that's the point where, instead of doing open source hardware based on a approach that is better suited to kind of hard-nosed Silicon Valley consumerism, maybe we can really start to make a genuine impact. Thank you. <laughs>